It's not typical for people to think of artists as planners, but when you make art, what you're doing most of the time is planning, only we have a special word for it, composition. If you think somehow the spontaneity, the creativity is lost in planning, then think for a moment about uh, Professor Norberg's example of someone trying to walk. Planning without actually having feedback from the environment is useless. You'll move in circles. And in fact, spontaneity comes from that feedback. There's a difference in emphasis and tone between planning and composition. And it can be found in the definition of the word composition itself. For our purposes, there are two definitions that are important. The word composition can mean the actual constituting parts, that is to say, all the different parts themselves, or it can be how you combine those to create a unified whole. And what's also important in composition is these two things are intricately related. They're a sort of loop. When we look at combining elements into a unified whole, we'll see how this self-referential loop will also have special scaling properties in the process as well as in the final whole. But for the moment, let's look at the parts. And in this case, let's start with the parts in a two-dimensional artwork. The point, one of the simplest and most powerful forms. When we think of the point, there are so many ways in which we use it. In one sense, it's completely imaginary. And yet in another, it builds everything about both our visual world and our mathematics. There is something silent and enigmatic in the point, and it's reflected in how we use it in language in writing. We use it to create pauses and stops. Take for instance, today I'm going to the movies. Today I am going to the movies. Today I am going to the movies. And you can see how it radically changes how we say and even think of the for words. Points almost seem to defy scale. We find them at all levels, and yet they have this great similarity between when we see a point at a thousand times magnification and when we look out into the sky at the distant stars. Nor are points in the arts simply dots on pieces of paper or dots of light in the sky. The terminology and dance of points is derived from the point, the dancer stretching out in a leap towards a single point, in the light, swift contact of toes across the stage. Or like here in these architectural forms, the point is both real and imaginary, sometimes at the same time. The point fluidly changes between being a real experience sensation and an imaginary concept. Put the point in motion and you find the line. The line has so many moods and possibilities, straight, curvy, thick, thin, ordered, and disarray. Line, when it is alone in our environment, is associated most with motion and just as it is inside two-dimensional art whether it's a slow movement of the river as it descends towards the sea or the gentle drift of a blossom in the air or the speed and force of lightning or cars however we see it the line for us is the point in motion Look at how simple lines are able to so effectively engender movement, form, playfulness, force, charm, and yes, sheer delight. Put the line in motion again and magic happens. Now we make closed forms, the circle, the square. This seems self-evident. You make a plane from a line. 
and yet in the hands of an artist this can produce forms of great subtlety and intricacy. Looking at this copy of a Raphael by Degas, one can see how in the classical tradition form is built up in layers and layers of carefully placed lines. Line can be used to build two of the other central components of composition, texture and tonal value, that is the lightness or darkness. You can see too that dots can also serve to illustrate both value, that is light and dark, as well as texture. In fact, almost all images that you see around you are built from dots because the computer screen, most modern print, is all based on an intricate web of interlocking points. Even color can be dealt with as a mesh of points. Because color is such a large subject, we'll deal with that later. Lines and dots don't just produce positive spaces, they also produce negative spaces. But those are sometimes hard to see. Even when negative space is relatively easy to see, like in this vase with the faces in the negative space, we still seem to have to go back and forth between seeing the faces and seeing the vase. This is even more true as our eye tries to see both the old woman in profile and the young woman who her head turned away in this optical illusion. Yet negative space is part of every image, even those images where it's not as clear. The sky may not normally make a shape as clear as it is in this photograph, but that shape is there every time. The Japanese place special emphasis on negative space. In fact, they have a special word for work that exhibits good negative space, and it's notin, and it means dark and light, and it's usually symbolized by the yin and yang. In work with good notin, there is a strong connection between both the positive space and the negative space created by the objects. This kind of strong interconnection between the positive and negative space, noten, is not just in Japanese art. One finds it in Greek vases, in logo design. Even for works who do not have the same ambiguous relationship between the foreground, the background, the negative and the positive space, like this Escher print, negative space is always there and always important. In the next section, we'll talk about how we put together a composition.